Our program today is an update on jumping worm research by Dr. Lee Freilich. It is sponsored by the Kellodale Garden Club of the Edina Garden Council. The Edina Garden Council's projects include the Friday, May 6th and Saturday, May 7th, 2022 plant sale to be held at Arneson Acres Park in Edina. The public is invited to attend. The Edina Garden Council also contributes to scholarships for horticulture students. Other Edina Garden Council projects have included Edina City Park beautification projects such as raising the funding for the fountain at Arneson Acres Park as well as donating the gazebo and tranquility garden in Arneson Acres Park. The Kellodale Garden Club is one of five garden clubs affiliated with the Edina Garden Council. Each club in the EGC plants one of the city of Edina gardens. Kellodale Garden Club's garden is located at the city fire station on Tracy Avenue. Projects that the Kellodale Garden Club financially supports include noxious weed abatement and habitat restoration at Lake Cornelia Park in Edina. The Kellodale Garden Club raises funding to have the Minnesota Native Landscapes Company remove buckthorn and other noxious weeds there. The Kellodale Garden Club then scatters Minnesota Native wildflower seeds in the areas where noxious weeds have been removed. All native plantings are either raised from seed or scattered as seed to reduce transmission of jumping worms in natural areas. It is a great honor to introduce Dr. Lee Freilich to speak about his research on the latest invader in our gardens, jumping worms. Dr. Freilich has an ongoing research project on invasive jumping worms at the University of Minnesota's Landscape Arboretum. His research project has many different strategies for the control of jumping worms. Today, we're fortunate that he will give us an update on his research results. Dr. Freilich is the director of the University of Minnesota Center for Forest Ecology. He has authored 200 publications with 275 co-authors from 25 countries. The Web of Science has listed him among the top 1% of all scientists in the world in the ecology and environment category. His research has been featured in news media 500 times, including the New York Times, Newsweek, and the Washington Post. His current research interests include large-scale fire and wind, earthworm invasion, and climate change in temperate and boreal forests. Welcome, Dr. Freelich. Thank you for that introduction. Now I think you can see my slides, so thank you for that introduction. And the first thing I want to do is acknowledge all the people listed here who are the ones that actually do all the work. All I do is tell them what to do. So we have a couple graduate students, Tyler Bauman and, and Louis Goodall here. We have UM Extension from Rochester, Angie Gupta, UM Duluth, Ryan Hofmeyer, and then of course we have Aaron Buckholz from UM Landscape Arboretum, who's the integrated pest specialist, who is doing a lot of work with us and facilitating all we're doing at the Arboretum. And then Kyung Soo Yu is a professor in the Department of Soil, Water, and Climate, so we need a soil scientist. And then Jim Calkins is with the Minnesota Nursery and Landscape Association, so we have a lot of of people working on this project to characterize this new invasion. But first, I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of background about earthworms in general. And there are 7,000 species. There weren't any native earthworms in Minnesota at the time the European settlers arrived, however, but there are 7,000 species, and some of them are that long and bright blue in color. Some of them are six feet long, like this one from Australia, which is the biggest in the world. Very interesting group of species, and Darwin actually wrote a book about earthworms after Origin of the Species. This was the last thing he published just before he died. He spent 10 years doing research on earthworms and came to the conclusion that they've had more influence on the world in, in terms of making the earth what it is today than any other group of organisms in the history of the earth and they go back about 500 million years. So they've done a lot in all that time. There are billions or trillions of them that have existed. So this is a map of global worming, not global warming, but global worming. So invasive earthworms are on every continent except Antarctica. You see the 17 
taxonomic families of earthworms listed here. And on each continent, the blue ones have all native species. The light red ones have some native and some invasive species. And the dark red ones are all non-native species. As you can see, every, every continent here has some native species and a bunch of non-native ones as well. Invasive earthworms are everywhere. And even when they invade an area that already has native worms, the invasive species is likely to do something different to the soil than the native worms, and it will still cause change to the ecosystem and to gardens. The jumping worms are found in North and South America, Europe, Australia, so the jumping worms are pretty widespread as invasive worms as well. And in Minnesota, we have a well-established European earthworm invasion that came with European settlers. So that's been around for a century. And now the new invasion, the jumping worm invasion of worms that come from Asia, probably the, the earliest date of invasion was around the year 2000 in Minnesota. But the big spread of, of jumping worms has just been in the last several years. These are some of our European species that are already established. So the night crawler, I'm sure you all know that it's our biggest species. Generally, they're six inches long. I've seen them 18 inches long. They live for years and years, unlike jumping worms, which are annuals. But as we'll see, jumping worms are displacing the night crawlers as they invade. The ones in the bottom right here, the angle worms, are ones that live in the soil. Endogeic means they live in the soil all the time, and they may be deep enough in the soil that they can coexist with the jumping worms, which live on the very top of the soil. And so we've got a variety of species of European worms. There's about 12 in Minnesota. They're just about everywhere except a few places up north, like the Boundary Waters and the North Shore. So 95% of Minnesota is already totally infested with European worms. Epiendogeic means species that live on the surface and in the top inch or two of the soil. So we've got one European species that does that and jumping worms fit into that group as well and they are displacing the leafworm Lumbricus rubellus as well as the nightcrawler Lumbricus terrestris as they invade. There are stages of invasion, so originally Minnesota had forest floors that thick and it was like a mattress, very spongy. Dead leaves are essentially a pile of earthworm food, but earthworms do for a living is eat dead leaves, so when the European worms came, one species after another, they over several decades when they invade a given place will transform that thick forest floor into a bare forest floor like you see in the bottom picture there, stage five. And the night crawlers will then eat all the new leaves that fall on the surface of the soil every year and maintain it in a leafless condition, essentially indefinitely, or at least until the jumping worms come and displace the night crawlers. Jumping worms fit into this high stage with a lot of biomass, a lot of worms. We're debating whether we should call it stage six because the impacts are really ramped up compared to anything European earthworms can do because they, the densities of worms are much higher. The biomass is higher. They're much more active, as we will see. And as I said, earthworms fit in the decomposer, so everything dies eventually and goes into the dead organic matter pool. Most of that matter is from plants. It's the dead leaves of plants. And what earthworms do is they eat those dead leaves and release the nutrients back into the ecosystem so they can be used again. So nutrients are cycled over and over by going into trees, up through the trees, into the leaves, and then falling back on the forest floor and then being decomposed so the nutrients are released. The problem with invasive earthworms is they release the nutrients so fast the trees can't grab them and nutrients are leached out and the forest actually becomes more nutrient poor. And so they have all these impacts on native ecosystems. They change the structure of the soil. The European earthworms actually compact it the jumping worms uncompact the top two inches and leave what's below that compacted. They get rid of the organic horizon, which people know as duff. It's like the natural mulch layer that changes soil temperature. It changes the water, the nutrient status that alters the microbes. All of that influences which plants can grow there, changes the plant community, and the plant community is the habitat for wildlife. 
through all of these cascading effects, earthworms, as Darwin said in 1881, change everything in the ecosystem. And they have these cascading effects on climate change because they release a lot of CO2 from the soil. Nutrients leach into the water, so they're bad for water quality. They reduce forest and crop productivity. Wildlife habitat, I already mentioned, they facilitate invasive plants like buckthorn and garlic mustard. And because the jumping worm invasion is new, we don't even know what invasive plants they're going to facilitate. Maybe something that co-evolved with them in their native habitat, which is Korea and northern Japan and adjacent China. Maybe some new invasive plants will come because these worms will create an ideal condition for them because they were co-evolved on their home continent. They influence disease dynamics because they change tick habitat on the forest floor for the ticks that carry Lyme disease. They also can facilitate diseases and insect pests of crops and forests. This is one of our earthworm invasion sites up near Leech Lake in northern Minnesota. At this particular site, we discovered calcium, magnesium, potassium, and phosphorus have been leached out of the system, and sugar maple trees are not growing as well as they used to. And they cause soil erosion. So the European earthworms cause slow soil erosion. The jumping worms greatly accelerate it when they come in on top of the European worms. And you see here a sugar maple that's probably 70 years old. And no way does a sugar maple have stilt roots like this. They germinate so that just the beginning of the root flare is at the surface of the soil. So this means that three to five inches of soil has eroded from this place because the level of the tree stays the same and the soil erodes. So invasive earthworms do cause erosion and jumping worms will probably accelerate that hugely. And this is just cumulative growth of sugar maples from a whole bunch of different places in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan from 1950 past 2010. And this lower line here is the growth of the highly infested earthworm sites, 30% less growth Sugar maples getting dieback in the crown because of nutrient stress from the loss of nutrients because of the earthworm invasion. And then for the native plants, there are winners and losers. Any big change in the environment causes winners and losers among native species or invasive species. So the winners are sedges, which are grass-like plants that are taking over forest understories, and jack in the pulpit, which has oxalic acid that nothing likes. Deer don't like it, earthworms don't wanna get near them. And what we're losing are orchids, trilliums, violets, all sorts of native plants that just aren't adapted to the new environment the invasive earthworms are creating. And as I said, buckthorn is facilitated by earthworm invasion. And here's an invading front of buckthorn moving through a forest. And as I also said, they can cause problems for crops. Earthworms invade, they facilitate buckthorn. Buckthorn's the overwintering host for soybean aphid, which you see on soybean leaves here. That causes a problem for soybean farmers that we didn't previously have. And then the aphids are eaten by Asian lady beetles that gather on people's house in the fall and cause allergies for people. This whole complex of changes, change the soil, change the nutrients, that changes forest productivity, that changes the biodiversity, which affects the environment and the economy. It changes crop productivity, affects the economy. Buckthorn, aphids, Asian lady beetles, allergies for humans, ticks, are influenced because they live on the forest floor causing Lyme disease. And did you know invasive earthworms cause giant ragweed seeds to germinate and grow much better than without earthworms? And so they even cause allergies known as hay fever, which is caused by ragweed pollen in August and September. So a lot of implications here for the environment, the economy, and for human health. One of the biggest thing they do is emit CO2 a lot of carbon that would stay in the forest floor over vast acreages of North America, Canada, Alaska, Northern Europe, Russia is being eaten by earthworms and turned into CO2. They're helping emit CO2. They're exacerbating droughts by removing that natural mulch layer over gigantic swaths of forest. 
accelerating conversion of boreal forest to other forest types, increasing biodiversity losses that climate change causes, and facilitating invasive species that are good competitors in a changing climate. So they interact a lot with that. Now to the specifics, what you've been waiting for <laughs> about jumping worms. So that's all the context that their jumping worms are coming into. So we have 14 species in North America and two of the genera and two or three species are probably present in Minnesota in the two Amintha species and one Metafire species is probably present in Minnesota. They move around in mulch, whereas the European worms were mainly moved around as fishing bait. So they were able to go into some of the most remote areas and even in the boundary waters because they're taken there as fishing bait, whereas jumping worms have moved around in mulch, also in nursery stock. They're more aggressive than the Europeans. They are annuals. They are programmed to die in the fall or early winter, but they lay eggs in the soil that are in cocoons, in little silk cocoons, and that's how they survive the winter. Unlike a night crawler can live five or six up to 20 years. These are annual species, just like annual plants. So they're kind of like the petunias of the animal world. And so here's their life cycle. And you see here Hemanthus agrestus, which is our most common species in Minnesota, which we've found in many places from St. Paul campus here. But they're from November to April, they're only in these little cocoons that have eggs for half the year. And they start hatching in late April. So you have juveniles in May and June and adults from July through October. If you have a warm fall, adults can hang around into November too, if it's a warmer than average fall, which we've had recently. You might remember we had tornadoes on the 15th of December, which meant that fall lasted a really long time. And so they survived a little longer than shown in this diagram, but this is their basic life cycle. And of course, it varies a little bit in spring and fall from year to year, because we all know spring and fall come at different times in different years. As gardeners, you should know that. I'm sure you do. How can you differentiate them from a European earthworm, since we have both, and you need to know which? Well, the jumping worms are very aggressive. They thrash around a lot when you touch them. But just their anatomy, if you're just looking at one and you don't touch it, so it sits there and you can look at it, the clitellum, which is the band that goes around the worm, is different. So you'll notice on the jumping worm, it's much closer to the nose. And if you count the segments, so earthworms are annelids, which have segments, it's about 14 segments from the nose to the clitellum. Whereas on a nightcrawler, it's 32 segments. So it's closer to the middle of the worm in the European species and closer to the nose on the jumping worms. In addition to that, the plytellum on the European worm is more like a saddle. It doesn't go all the way around. It sits on it just like a saddle sits on a horse. If you were to turn the earthworm upside down, and believe it or not, they have up and down. They have dorsal and ventral surfaces, just like any other animal species. You'd see it doesn't go all the way around, whereas on the jumping worm, it's what we call an annular clitellum. It goes completely around, completely encircles the worm. So those are the anatomical differences. Here's what the jumping worms do to the soil. They turn it into granules, and these are loose. They're not attached to each other. They're very loose and they can be washed away in rain, but it looks like coffee grounds or cat litter. And the granule size starts out small in the spring, and gets bigger as the summer goes because the worms get bigger. And these are the castings of the worms. So the bigger the diameter of the worm, the bigger the castings that come out the rear end. And so in areas infested with jumping worm, it's about one to two inches deep and the, especially by late summer, by August, of these very loose granules. You can just reach in with your hand and dig through these granules, and the worms are usually right at the bottom of that two-inch layer and come up with a handful of worms in August. And you can't do that with European earthworms. Everybody knows it's a lot of work to get night crawlers to come out of the ground if you want to use them for fishing bait, right? They're very finicky and you have to use all sorts of methods to try to get them to come up to the surface. Well, jumping worms are always close to the surface. They love mulched beds. 
not that you would never find European earthworms in mulched beds. They can live there, but jumping worms like to live right under the mulch. They really like wood chip mulch and leaf mulch the most. But what the mulch does is it keeps the soil cool in the hottest part of the summer. So jumping worms will die at about 85 degrees, which is not all that hot. So if the soil gets up to 85 degrees, the adult worms will die. And that's why they stay in beds with thick mulch or the north sides of buildings or areas with big shade trees or areas that are irrigated because the irrigation will also keep the soil cool if it's sprinkled with water every day, like a lot of irrigation systems are on every day. In a lawn that is not irrigated and that is open and sunny, we don't find jumping worms there. We find them in mulch garden beds, in shade gardens or areas with big shade trees and on the north sides of buildings and north sides of hills where the soil temperature never gets above 85 degrees. We do find them on south facing hills if the mulch is like three inches thick. It can still stay cool enough if the mulch is thick enough at the surface of the soil. About 30% of all the mulched beds on St. Paul and Minneapolis campus have Amenthus agrestis because we did a survey of a couple hundred garden beds on campus and discovered 30% are infested. We went to the main mulch pile that the university has, which is on the east side of St. Paul campus, right next to the fairgrounds. And they bring trees in there that are cut down and put them through a chipper and make this wood chip mulch that they distribute around campus. Well, guess what? The main mulch pile for the university is infested with jumping worms. <laughs> So it's not surprising that they're spread around. And we discovered the same at the Arboretum. They make their own wood chip mulch. But now that we looked at their mulch piles and discovered jumping worms are in them, they are altering their process for making wood chips. So they trim trees and they have branches which they put through a chipper. And I can tell you the worms are not living in those trees. <laughs> they are earthworms, they live in the earth. They're not living in the chipper, but if you put a pile of that mulch, which they, they were doing just on the ground to store it before you use it, the worms will be attracted to it and go into the mulch pile, and then you will distribute them all over the place when you distribute the mulch. Um, we even had one mulch pile at the Arboretum, which they chipped up the wood and made a mulch pile in the middle of an asphalt parking lot, and that was full of jumping worms. And what happened is, there were some times where it rained during the night, and so they were able to crawl out from adjacent garden beds and crawl across the pavement and get into the mulch while it was raining at night. So they wouldn't get baked by the sun, but the water made it easy to go over the asphalt without getting scratched and so on, which earthworms really dislike. Even in the middle of a parking lot, they were able to get into a mulch pile. And so here's how they get distributed. Commercial mulch these days is heat treated, so we don't think there's a lot of infestations that are coming from commercial mulch, because now it's heat treated way above 105 degrees, which is what it takes to kill the eggs of jumping worms. They're actually heating it up to 135 or 140 in order to kill other pests that might be in the mulch. So most commercial mulch is clean. What happens is, if a nursery buys a bunch of it and puts it in a pile to store it until it's used and it's sitting on the ground, it gets reinfested with worms. And so it didn't come from the commercial mulch company. With the worms in it, it gets recontaminated. And also compost like community mulch piles where people bring their leaves, most of those that we visited are full of jumping worms. There's nothing jumping worms like better than a big giant pile of leaves. And then that can go to hundreds or thousands of urban gardens. And if people take plants or mulch to their cabin, it could get out into the cabin and out into the forests and other natural habitats. We have found them also in nurseries, although nurseries are learning to deal with that now. So it's getting less and less likely that nursery stock will have jumping worms in because Jim Calkins with the Minnesota Nursery and Landscape Association is part of this project and he's been teaching nurseries how to deal with jumping worms if they have an infestation and plant sales. But now all the garden clubs are aware of the problem and they're taking steps to sell clean plants. So we're examining these pathways as part of our project.
This is distribution as of December 2021. I just looked at this EdMaps website today and discovered a bunch of additional sites in Illinois. So somebody added some new data since this. But notice Minnesota there. Minnesota does not have more jumping worms than the rest of the eastern U.S. I mean, southern Michigan, Illinois, the east coast, Connecticut, New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, those places are much more infested, but people just haven't reported them there. Whereas because of our project, a lot of people in Minnesota, because we've talked to many garden clubs and master gardener county chapters in Minnesota, we have a lot of reports because we taught all these master gardeners how to make a report of jumping worms. In fact, our website has a course you can take, an online training course that takes about an hour or so where you can learn to identify them and file a report. But as you can see, they're in southeastern Minnesota all the way up to about St. Cloud. If we were to look elsewhere, we would probably find more, but we've been concentrating on this area that we know is infested. The metro area has lots of reports Hennepin County alone has 190 reports, and that's because Hennepin County Master Gardeners is the biggest chapter. There's a lot of people. They heard our lecture and went out and found them all over the place and made reports. I think the whole metro area is pretty much infested, even out in the suburbs, as you can see here, out to Lakeville and all the way out to the St. Croix and all the way up to Anoka in the north and so on. These are the cocoons, and they range in size from two millimeters, which is about a sixteenth of an inch up to maybe as much as a quarter inch. There are a few of these big ones like you see on the left, but most of them are the medium and small size here from a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch in size. Initially, when you look at them, they just look like a soil particle, but you can get an eye for them. They do have a distinctive shape and a little tiny point on one end, and you can get an eye for them and learn to see them just in a handful of soil and learn to sift them out. And of course, these can stick to the feet of wildlife or shoes, and they can flow with water during heavy thunderstorms when you get water flowing down the sidewalks and so on. These are small and very light. They're lighter than soil, of course, because they're silk, which is lighter than a piece of soil, which is made out of silica and other heavy things. And they do float with water flow during heavy thunderstorms, and they can go hundreds of feet in one storm. So what we're doing is characterizing the soil temperatures in different habitats, as I mentioned earlier, with these little things called eye buttons, which are actually the size of a nickel, as shown here. You can program them to measure temperature every hour. And so you just bury them in the soil, leave them for six months or a year, download the data into the computer, and it tells you what it was every hour for the last six months. And then you can empty their little computer and reprogram and use them another six months. So we're characterizing these temperature regimes in where the worms will live and where they won't, which I mentioned earlier. Here's from last summer, socially distanced field work where the Arboretum said we had to stay six feet apart. <laughs> Hopefully that won't be the case this summer. But this is part of our crew. Some of the people that I mentioned at the beginning who are doing the work at the Arboretum. And these are some of the things that we're trying in our experiment to control the worms. So we have plots that are about four or five meters, which is about 15 feet in diameter, where we're testing all of these. So saponins, they are natural chemicals that occur in the leaves of plants. Saponins are especially abundant in tea, and there are leftover saponins when a manufacturer manufactures tea bags, and they sell that, and they sell it to golf courses because they use it to repel worms on greens of golf courses and they've had some success with that. And they also sell it to health food stores because people take saponins as a health food supplement. So talk about an environmentally friendly chemical. People take it as a health food supplement, but it repels worms. So we're hoping that this one will be a good control agent Sulfur granules, which could lower the pH. We know earthworms don't like low pH. Diatomaceous earth, I'm sure most gardeners are aware it has little particles that are quite sharp that a lot of insects don't like. So we're hoping that will be the case for worms. And botanogard, which is actually a suspension of fungal spores, a fungus called bovaria. These fungal spores 
are incapable of infecting people, but they can infect certain insects and worm species. So you just mix it with water and spray the area and certain worm and insect species in that area get infected with this fungus and die. And so the company that makes Botanigard is hoping that we will show that it's effective against jumping worms so they can license it for that. Because right now nothing is actually licensed for control of jumping worms. So this is all research at this point, although there's nothing to stop you from trying diatomaceous earth or saponins in your own garden. Just because it doesn't say it's licensed for earthworm control, it doesn't mean somebody's going to come and arrest you if you buy some and, and use it. But we're doing an actual trial, and this is the field site. So it, it's a wood, so it's equivalent to a shade garden, and 15-foot diameter circles are, you know, on the same spatial scale as a garden, and we're applying it as directed on the label because we want to see if it's effective if it's used the way the manufacturer recommends. And this is the site. So these are the circles 15 feet in diameter. And there's a list of the different treatments there that are different colors here. So each treatment has four replicates. We also have a leaf litter removal just to see if removing all litter and maintaining bare soil will decrease their population because we know that leaf litter, which is a type of mulch, when that's gone, the soil will not stay as cool and it's also food for the worms. So we're raising the temperature and, and taking away food with that treatment. And we wondered, what are we gonna do with all this leaf litter? So we have another treatment that's double leaf litter. So we just move it from the leaf litter removal plots to the double leaf litter. And we're predicting that there should be twice as many worms there as in the control plots where we don't do anything. And, and hopefully no worms in the leaf litter removal. And then we've got the saponin, botanigard, sulfur, and diatomaceous earth treatments. We also have a drought-free treatment in that kind of bright pink color where we're just watering those plots during droughts. And that will tell us whether droughts are reducing their populations because the control plots, again, don't have any watering. But the drought-free control, we would water anytime there's a dry spell more than two weeks long. So we can see how leaf litter affects them, whether it's no leaf litter, double leaf litter, normal amount of leaf litter. Um, we can see how droughts affect them, and we can see how all these different fairly friendly chemicals affect worm populations. So we started this last summer, and we think we'll have pretty good data by the end of summer 2022. We might run the experiment until the end of summer 2023 to get really, really good results. We also have leading edges of invasion at the Arboretum where jumping worms have moved out of some of the garden beds and are moving into the forest. They have some really nice forests. So we have no jumping worms and worms present on either side of this leading edge of invasion. And they are moving through the forest, but we know where the edge is. And so we can study each side of the invasion front. And this is an aerial view. And you can see the maple forest, which is next to the hosta beds at the Arboretum. And that it's also where they make their maple syrup. We have a group of study sites in the jumping worm infested and further away from where the, the leading edge of invasion hasn't reached. So we can compare the same at wood duck forest and magnolia forest. Using these, we can see their impact on native plant species, which is something that a lot of people are worried about. So we're comparing the native plant communities in the infested and uninfested areas in the woods at the Arboretum. So far we've found, and this is just preliminary because we're going to collect a lot more data next summer, but last summer we were able to get this much data. So the lighter colored line is the jumping worm infested area, and we only surveyed three hectares, which is seven and a half acres. Whereas the non-jumping worm, we surveyed a lot bigger area, but at the seven and a half acre level here, we're finding a difference of upwards of 20 native species present. So it looks like jumping worms are really a big negative factor for native plant species, which is kind of unfortunate. And then we're looking at soil erosion. And again, these granules are loose and at the Arboretum, some of the steep slopes which are forested, you step on them and you can literally slide down. It's like being on a bunch of ball bearings with all these little granules. And we have hills that have piles of soil at the bottom. So we know they're increasing erosion of soil. 
one thing we're going to do is look at cesium-137, and I bet you probably don't know what that is, but cesium is an element. Cesium-137 is a radioactive form of cesium that is everywhere in the world from atomic and nuclear bomb tests in the 1950s, and it was deposited everywhere in the world, but what we can do now is look at two hills, one that has jumping worms and one that doesn't, and if there's more cesium at the bottom of the hill with the jumping worms than higher on the slope compared to the hill that without jumping worms. That means it's moving down the slope with the soil. That's one way of quantifying whether there's more erosion with the jumping worms. And we're also looking at competition between jumping worms and the European worms that have been here for a long time testing the hypothesis that they replace European worms. And so far we found that they do replace night crawlers. When the jumping worms invade, say, a given square yard, the night crawlers move out of that. And then as the jumping worm invasion front moves, the night crawlers move out and they just can't compete with the jumping worms, which are more aggressive. Some of the European species that live deep in the soil might persist. But we'll see. We'll collect a more data this summer and see what's going on there. And so that's what I prepared to say. And I just wanted to acknowledge funding. The Invasive Terrestrial Plants and Pest Center at the university was the biggest funder, but we have donations from people here. Olseth Family Foundation, Darby and Jerry Nelson, the Woodrill Fellowship, which funded a graduate student, and that was Bruce Dayton, who was our recently retired Governor Mark Dayton's father, who started Target Corporation, the LCCMR, the Legislative Citizens Commission on Minnesota Resource, which uses the Environment Trust Fund, which is lottery money. When you play the lottery and don't win, it isn't all wasted. Some of it comes to the university for this type of research, so keep playing the lottery. These are some websites with more information. Top one is our website at the university that has this link to the online training module that you can take. The Minnesota DNR has a nice page that has some frequently asked questions that you can look at. It has recommended practices for plant sales that you can click on and download a PDF. It has a lot of nice things. And then the Terrestrial Plants and Pest Center website has a website that has information specific to our project as well. There's also a University of Minnesota Extension website, which I didn't list here. So there's at least four websites now that have a lot of good information that you can look at. And if you Google Jumping Worms Minnesota, these websites will come up so that you can click on them. With that, I think I will stop, share, and take questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Freilich, for uh, that wonderful presentation. I will now do screen share, and I would like to also tell the audience how they can donate to your project too. So if anyone would like to donate to your research project, please make the check payable to University of Minnesota Foundation and add the Forest Ecology Fund on the memo line. Mail that to Dr. Lee Freelich at the Department of Forest Resources at 1530 Cleveland Avenue North, St. Paul, Minnesota, 55108. I think we'll be needing more of your research that you have found so far is very helpful. So I'll lead off with a question here. You indicated that cocoons that are killed at minus 11 degrees Fahrenheit. The question yeah. is, how long do temperatures have to stay below 11 degrees? And is less time required if temperatures are lower than that? And how far down in the soil does that 11 degree apply? And would plants overwintered in pots outside, above the ground, under bags of leaves, be free of cocoons. Potted plants in Minnesota would get colder than that, probably, if they were not insulated in any way. If, if they're embedded in bags of leaves or something, they would not get that cold. In soil, in your garden or in the forest, actually getting down to something like minus 10 or minus 12 degrees is very rare. It would mean an Arctic cold front without any snow, and it would only affect the top inch or two of soil. Of course, that's where all the cocoons are. Unlike European earthworm cocoons, which can be a foot or two feet below the surface, all the jumping worm cocoons are in the top two inches. 
the report about the minimum temperature they can withstand comes from Vermont. And they had an event where all the snow melted in a warm spell in January, and then they had an Arctic cold front with no snow on the ground. It got down to minus 10 or minus 12 in the top two inches of the soil. That's what it took. Actually, I don't think they did die at that temperature, but they couldn't find any place colder than that. <laughs> So actually, we think that um, it never gets cold enough in the soil, even in Minnesota, to kill them. Generally, we have snow on the ground, and it doesn't get anywhere near that cold uh, in the soil. And believe it or not, um, in the boundary waters, we buried some temperature sensors all winter there several years ago. There was a major cold spell where it was minus 45 for several nights in a row and it never got colder than 30 degrees Fahrenheit in the soil because the snow is such a good insulator. So it's only if the snow melted and then you had an Arctic cold front that it would get down to minus 10 or minus 12. And they actually found in Vermont that that was not cold enough to kill them. So from that, we can conclude the soil never gets cold enough here or in Vermont or anywhere to kill the eggs. We might do a freezer experiment where we try to get colder than that. If it's minus 40 to kill them and it's never going to be minus 40 in the soil, why bother to do it? Because it would cost a lot of money um, to do that type of experiment because you need special research freezers that are very, very expensive compared to an ordinary freezer. So we already know it can't get cold enough in the soil. There are temperature monitoring stations that have been in place for decades in Minnesota, and they never have soil temperatures that cold because we always have snow that insulates the soil. So we already know cold can't kill them. Can jumping worms hatch any time of the year if we have a warm winter, especially if the cocoons are near cement or the warm side of a house or a structure? Yes. When we've had some early warm spells last spring, it was very warm in late March and early April, and they were hatched and they were already active in early April. So yeah, if you if you get an early warm spell early in the season, I think they only need about three months. So they need to be cold for a certain length of time, just like the seeds of certain plants or the branches of certain plants before they'll leaf out. They need a certain number of days of chilling. But certainly by mid-March, if they started their chilling in November, they've been sufficiently chilled. And if it gets warm enough, they could hatch. So they could hatch and then freeze and die. They hatched in March if there was an unusual warm spell. But last spring, they hatched in the first week of April. And by the third week of April, they were a couple inches long. That was the earliest I've seen them. I didn't look in the spring of 2012 because I wasn't doing research on jumping worms then, but you might remember it was in the 80s during spring break, which is the second week of March in 2012. It would have been interesting to look and see what happened that spring. Briefly describe how a worm can eat wood mulch. Oh, they have bacteria that are associated with the earthworm that produce an enzyme that dissolves the wood dissolves the wood into chemical constituents like carbon and nitrogen and so on, and the earthworms can just slurp it up. The earthworm has a mouth, doesn't have any teeth, and it can take things in by suction. So when they eat a leaf, for example, they just vacuum the cells out in between the veins of the leaf. And I'm sure you've all seen leaves in your garden or in the forest where the whole leaf was just a skeleton of all the veins because an earthworm vacuumed out all the cells and left just the veins. Describe yeah. how the jumping worms affect the tick population. We don't know how jumping worms affect the tick population because the studies that have been done are impacts of the European worms on tick populations. And they can both increase it and decrease it depending on the circumstances. Sometimes European worms cause more sedges, those grass-like plants in the forest, and that would favor ticks, but sometimes they cause a bare forest floor and that disfavors ticks, so that can be positive or negative depending on a given location, and we have not done any studies of jumping worm impacts on ticks yet, so I can't answer that part of the question. Can the jumpers spread down the Mississippi area? Oh, sure. They can They can easily spread down the, the Mississippi or any major river system. If they get in, say, the floodplain, they can be swept downriver basically unlimited distances during floods and be deposited somewhere downstream. That's very feasible, and, and I'm sure it's happening.
the windstorm could spread cocoons? That means leaf blowers can spread cocoons? Well, leaf blowers could, yeah, could easily spread cocoons. And you have to remember the cocoons are more resistant to drying than the worms. If you take a worm out of the soil and hold it in your hand in about 30 seconds, it'll start to dry out because it's a mucous membrane like you have inside your mouth. But that's the exterior of the worm. They have to be wet all the time. The cocoons don't need to be wet all the time. They're resistant not only to cold, but to being dry. So they could easily be blown by a leaf blower or wind once they get on the sidewalk. And what we've seen on campus here is from the student center down to Cleveland Avenue, there's a hill and we've seen piles of the cocoons after heavy thunderstorms in the sidewalk, like 300 feet from where the mulch beds are, where the worms were. And then the wind could come along and blow those off the sidewalk into the lawns or the, the garden beds 300 feet down the sidewalk, or people could just kick that pile of cocoons and they would go into the garden beds or a dog could walk by. So yeah, a lot of ways their cocoons can disperse amazingly easily and they're very resistant to temperature extremes and drying out and all sorts of adverse environmental conditions. Is there an amount of time they can be in the water when they're no longer viable? For example, it's recommended that we wash plant roots before moving or selling them. But then what do we do with the water? Can you decant it, pour off the top, and are the cocoons heavy enough they go to the bottom? And then um, you gather up the cocoons and fry them in the sun or yeah, I, strain them out uh, with a rice strainer. Yeah. How, how do we handle that? Well, I don't really know, actually. I think they're pretty light. I think they would be likely to float. Or if they didn't float on the surface, they would be very likely, if you tried to decant it, you'd have to decant it through a piece of cloth or something. You, it would be really hard to decant the water without the cocoons coming out because they're a lot lighter than soil particles. I have not seen a study on how long they can survive in water. But I, I bet you there is a study like that, and it's probably published in a scientific journal in Japan or Korea, and it's probably in Japanese or Korean, and I can't read it. <laughs> is there something we could put in the water that would kill the cocoons, but then we'd have to dispose of the water, and you wouldn't want to put that back on the garden. Maybe that would hurt the plants, whatever you use to yeah. kill the cocoons. Yeah, well... Certainly some of these things that people take to purify water when they're backpacking in the wilderness would, would kill them. But yeah, you, you wouldn't necessarily want to put that on the garden. Although if it was chlorine, that should like go out of the water into the atmosphere, right? If you let it sit for a while. But I think some of these chemicals that we're testing might be useful for that when we finally get that data. You know, the saponins especially would disperse in water. The diatomaceous earth would sink to the bottom. The elemental sulfur would probably sink to the bottom. The botanogard isn't going to infect a cocoon. It's only going to infect the adult worms, but the, the saponins might work for that. Of course, if you decanted it into a piece of cloth and, and set that in full sun, say in June, on a piece of black cloth, it would get up to 105, and that's what it takes to kill the cocoons. I mean, you mm -hmm. could heat treat the residue if you decanted it into a, something to strain it, because it's not hard to heat things up to 105 degrees. I mean, that's just a little hotter than bath water. So and in fact, Angie Gupta, in, who is our extension specialist at University of Minnesota, Rochester, got rid of a jumping worm infestation in her yard of her house on the south side of her house just by putting a sheet of black plastic on the garden in spring and leaving it there for a week. Because jumping worms are in the top two inches, you can easily get the top two inches of soil up to above 105 degrees in May or June when the sun is really intense. Is there some kind of mulch that we could use other than leaf mulch and bark chips like uh, pine needles or cocoa bean mulch that they don't like? Uh, those are scratchy type of mulches. I think the pine needle mulch they don't like because we've sampled under pine trees and under spruce trees and we haven't found them there. Even though a few feet away under a, a linden tree or a hackberry or an elm or whatever, we find the worms. I think pine needle mulch, it's both acidic and it's physically tough and scratchy, so worms don't like it. Some bark mulches are acidic enough to keep them out and some aren't. 
you know, we're, we're planning to do some more research on different mulch types. What about cocoa bean mulch? I'm not sure about cocoa bean mulch, but you know, that might be something that we try next summer because the Arboretum is open to trying different mulch types, like in garden beds that we know are infested, we could remove the mulch that's there and try several types. And I think they're open to doing an experiment like that. I think they're gonna try coffee grounds because the cafe has a lot of coffee grounds. And I think some of the volunteers are just gonna try coffee grounds right. just, just for fun, which are pretty acidic. I don't think earthworms will like the acidity of coffee, which, which doesn't matter for people at all because your stomach has a pH of two and a half or three, so it doesn't hurt people, but it would be really bad for worms. I mean, if you were to eat a worm, it would definitely die in your stomach. The uh, night crawlers are used for fish bait. Do you think the jumping worms are going to be used for fish bait? Is there any reason fishermen wouldn't think of using them? When you buy fishing bait, it's almost always the European species. You can use jumping worms as fishing bait, but it's darn hard because when they're in your hand, they squiggle like that and jump out of your hand. It's pretty hard to get them on the hook. And sometimes they will jump out of your hand and just leave the tail in your hand because they can detach the last 10 segments of the worm. I mean, I've had them in my hand and the worm jumped out of my hand so fast I didn't even see it jump and I was left with just the tail which continues to wiggle and that's an adaptation to predators so salamanders and moles and voles and of course birds can eat them but if one of those predators catches it by the tail they just dissociate the tail just eject it and keep going and then they grow a new tail and the predator still gets something to eat they can still eat the tail and when you use them as fishing bait, they tend to detach like that and they jump out of your hand and you so fast you can't even see it. And it's because they wiggle so violently, you can hardly get them on the hook. You said that at 105 degrees, that would kill the worms the uh, top couple inches of the soil. Does it have to stay at 105 degrees very long or when it just hits 105 then they're gone. I'm hoping with global warming, we don't see days like that. But yeah. could that result in boom and bust cycles of these if we have a real warm summer and we have a day that hits 105? Yep. It could. Yeah. And that's for the cocoons, though. The adult worms are killed at 85. Mm -hmm. And we did have some areas where they died last summer, you know, because last summer was the record warmest summer in the Twin Cities ever recorded. It beat 1936, not by a lot, by a few tenths of a degree. Actually, I think the summer of 36 is in fourth or fifth place now among our warmest summers ever recorded. So last summer was the warmest. We had some nights, you know, where it stayed in the 80s all night, got up around 100 during the day, and that did wipe them out on south facing hills, mm -hmm. but they still persisted on north facing hills. They still persisted on the north sides of buildings. They still persisted in irrigated areas with automatic irrigation systems because it never got anywhere, didn't even get up to 85 degrees in the soil, let alone 105. And they persisted in wooded areas, which tend to stay quite cool. The European worms, by the way, they can't tolerate being 85 degrees either, but they're capable of going down two feet. So when you get a heat wave like we had last summer, they go down a couple feet into the ground where it doesn't get warmer than 65 or 70, and they just wait there until it cools down at the surface and then come back up in September. The jumping worms can't do that. They are stuck in the top two inches. They need more oxygen than the European worms so they can't go deep in the soil. So it's easier to kill them by hot temperatures, but there are so many places across the landscape that don't get that hot even in a heat wave. Are there some kinds of plants that might be too delicate for root washing? For example, native orchids that have to have mycorrhiza along with the roots, and then you would wash that off, or perhaps very fine, fibrous rooted plants. Have, have you encountered any kind of recommendations where root washing would not work? No, I just don't know enough about that. My guess is that there are people who belong to the Native Plant Society who would know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. 
and I am a member of the Native Plant Society, so maybe I'll ask them next time I see some of them. It is likely, yeah, some of the native plants are really hard to transplant. You know, mm -hmm. you can transplant yellow lady slippers and um, showy lady slippers, for, for example, but not pink lady slippers and not a lot of the other orchid species. Even if you take them with a huge chunk of soil and you move them someplace else, they just like don't like that spot and won't grow. And there are a lot of native plants like that that are finicky, and we don't even know how to grow them. Um, and we just hope that the jumping worms don't wipe out the last remnants of them in, in the woods, which is why we're studying that topic. But that remains to be seen. Mm. Obviously, all the native orchids that live in northern Japan and Korea and adjacent China over evolutionary time are co-evolved with jumping worms because they got along together for thousands of years but our orchids are not so so we'll see um as you know they have a native woodland garden at the arboretum and it, and it'll be interesting to see when the jumping worms reach and infest that native woodland garden i think it's named after one of the people in the dayton family maybe mary lee dayton who was a fan of wild native plants. It'll be interesting to see if all those species persist because the invasion front is almost there. We'll learn a lot when, when that gets infested. What about pouring tea on the soil? You said that tea leaves with uh, saponins might work. If you pour black tea uh, on the soil, do you think that would help? I don't know. That's something to try. Yeah, you know, this, the whole thing about this is this invasion is so new that, that we know very little mm -hmm. about it. And so there's so many questions that I can't answer, which is kind of bad, but it's also kind of good because there's so many interesting things to investigate. <laughs> and one person asks here whether rubber mulch has been tried uh, and whether that would be good at discouraging them. Well, I don't know if it's been formally tried, but I would think it would be bad because it would be very hot right underneath it, and a lot of oxygen would not get through compared to um, leaf mulch or other mulch. So my prediction is it would be bad, but we don't have a trial, so that's something to try. Mm -hmm. Another person asks, uh, how do we deal with our backyard compost pile material that sits on the soil? I assume what they mean here is that normally you're, you're turning over your compost pile, and if it gets infested, um, do you just put it in the garbage or try to heat it up enough that you can get rid of whatever got into it? Or I would try to heat it enough. Try not to start it on fire, but try to heat it enough. If it's wet enough, you could probably heat it up without it starting to smolder because you only have to get it up to 105 to kill the worms. But if your yard is infested with worms a day later, even if you sterilized your mulch pile and they were in your yard, the next day they would be back in your mulch pile. So it would be kind of like trying to empty Lake Superior with a teaspoon. The context is important. Now, I had a compost tumbler that is above the ground, and you rotate that. But to what extent can these worms climb? Could they climb up tree bark, up a wall, up uh, something that is metal? Because uh, these compost tumblers sit up on a metal stand, and you rotate them. What do you think about that use? Yeah, the earthworms don't like bare metal. If it's painted, it might be okay. They don't like bare metal. Sometimes when we're doing an experiment in the greenhouse and we want to keep them in a pot, we can put like copper screen or something and they won't touch it. They don't like bare metal. And they especially don't like cut screen with a, with a shear and you have all those sharp points. They don't like that either. On a rainy night, they can climb up brick walls. They can climb up wood walls. They can climb up painted metal. I mean, we've had at my cabin, and these were European worms. We've had the roof full of night crawlers because some leaves got caught where the level of the roof is different and were wet from the rain. And you move in here, there's like a thousand night crawlers on the roof of the house. And you know they had to crawl up wall to get there, right? 
and I think jumping worms can climb as well. And we know that they climb up in hollow trees that, you know, arborists find them like 50, 60, 70 feet off the ground because inside a hollow tree, it's nice and moist and just the right temperature. Yeah, they can climb more than you think. One person asks, your tree leaves fall on the ground in the fall. Should you be raking them up and disposing of them? Now, normally you would let them uh, biodegrade into the soil and, and they would be a good amendment. Uh, but should we be getting rid of them now? I probably wouldn't because, um, you know, there's no sense in doing more environmental damage to, to, to solve a problem that's already causing damage and do something that causes even more damage. I would leave them. You know, when I was a kid for our lawns in the city, and some of you might remember this if you're old enough, when the leaves fell on the lawn, we just left them there until we had a couple days without rain and we just lit it on fire and the flaming front moved across the lawn and burned all the leaves. The grass was still green underneath, but it liberated all the nutrients and you didn't have to fertilize your lawn. That was the fertilizer. And then you couldn't do that because the smoke is a form of air pollution. Then we had to start throwing them out in bags. So they go to a community mulch pile. It was fun to, to light it on fire. And I personally, I liked the way it smelled and everything. And But yeah, you're right. If you have that type of yard where you have natural vegetation, um, it is best to leave that in its habitat for all sorts of native species that belong in the soil, even species that are pollinators, you know, beetles and wasps and um, larvae of various moths and so on can be living in that leaf litter, all of which could be pollinators. Mm -hmm. uh, now this question, uh, how confident can we be that the bags of compost that City of Edina hands out for free in the spring is coming from the food uh, scraps that we put in uh, to the city organics? That would be for the city compost uh, director. However, I having been on the city energy and environment commission, our compost does go to the Mindawapatan Sioux site where they do uh, treat it uh, properly and raise it to the, the proper temperatures. And uh, I am personally uh, very confident of that. Uh, if anyone wants to contact city of Edina, organics uh, coordinator to ask them further, you can, but uh, I use that compost and I think it's great. Would mice, voles in compost pile eat the worms? Well, I think birds and anything would find it yeah, tasty, wouldn't yeah, they, they will. They will eat the worms. A lot of people have wild turkeys in their neighborhood these days, and not only do they eat acorns, if you have big bur oak trees in your neighborhood, turkeys will show up in the fall. They will root around in the soil and eat jumping worms too, but they don't eat them as fast as they reproduce. So I'm not sure they would eliminate them, mm. but they would keep the population low. In the future, it may be a matter of just managing to keep the population low. Sometimes trying to exterminate things is a little bit extreme. And we're so early in this invasion and we're just starting to gain knowledge. So we'll have to see how good these management strategies are as they develop. Can you describe how they're a threat to frogs and salamanders and other creatures in the sense that they do tend to increase pollutants in their bodies? Yeah, earthworms can bioaccumulate heavy metals. And so there's mercury in soils all over the world from coal fired electrical plants because there's a little bit of mercury in coal. So there's mercury everywhere now. And that's bioaccumulated in earthworms, which then goes into the salamanders or woodcocks or whatever species eat them. And in severely polluted areas, it can, they can act, earthworms can actually be toxic. They can have enough heavy metals. There are certain urban sites that have a lot of, of heavy metals like lead and, and so on. And even out in rural areas where there used to be a smelter in mining country or you know, various industrial facilities in the past, there can be toxic levels of metals in earthworms and then the birds eat those and then people can't eat those even if they're a game species. So yeah, they are bioaccumulators.
And because they cause soil erosion, the little ponds where that salamanders and frogs depend on, they could end up being filled with eroded soil too. Well, thank you, Dr. Freilich. I'm, I'm not seeing any more questions. And I think we're going to have to have you back again uh, as your research uh, progresses. You've learned uh, wonderful things that we can use to help us to improve the environment in our garden and to preserve our native woodlands. We want to thank you and we encourage you to continue your research and we would love to have you back again. Sure, you're you're totally welcome, and I yeah, and I hope next time I come back, I will have learned a lot more from all of our research. And we'll do research in our backyards too. Yeah, sounds good. Well, thank you. We will end our recording now, and we look forward to seeing you again. Okay.